Hello, my name is Emily Ann Duffley and I'm a second year AUD student at Northwestern University. Today I'm going to be going through a hypothetical pediatric audiology case study that I've prepared for one of my courses. So our patient today is Mary Margarine, who's a nine month old female. She has bilateral sensory neural profound hearing loss and bilateral meaning that it's in both ears, sensory neural meaning that it's affecting either or the cochlea or the neural pathway and profound hearing loss meaning it is the most severe a hearing loss could possibly be. Her loss was identified during a newborn hearing screening during her first day of life and then diagnosed officially two weeks later with a tone burst APR or auditory brainstem response test. Her hearing loss is due to genetics and will not progress any further. She has no other significant medical history or conditions. Now let's talk a little bit about her family. So these are her parents and hearing loss runs on the maternal side of her family as her mother is deaf. Her mom currently has a cochlear implant on one side and receives partial benefit from it. She received it in 2014 and speaks some English but mainly communicates through ASL and her dad is hearing and is able to communicate fluently in both English and ASL. Now, importantly, both parents want Mary to grow up to be fluent in ASL and English. This is very important to keep in mind when deciding what path of treatment you're going to take for a child. All right, so because Mary's parents want her to be able to communicate in English, she needs to have access to sound in addition to the visual cues needed for ASL. So we decided to go with a pair of Phonax Sky Marvel Super Power Behind the Ear Hearing Aids with custom ear molds in order to make sure that she's receiving maximum amplification. Now, I chose these hearing aids because they were capable of amplifying enough to treat her profound loss, and they're also very kid-friendly. Well, there's no rechargeable option at the moment for this level of power in the Phonax hearing aids. Um, they do have a tamper-resistant battery door that you can put on the hearing aids to prevent the hearing aid battery door from opening if the child wished to chew on it or something like that. This helps prevent there being a choking hazard associated with this device that's so easily accessible for the baby at all times. Also, if Mary's family had decided to keep these hearing aids long term, they have great connectivity options for streaming devices like to an iPad or to a Roger pen that could be used in a classroom to make the classroom easier to hear in. But unfortunately, we figured out through this hearing aid trial that the hearing aids are not really helping Mary at all. Um, it was estimated that she received no audibility from these hearing aids. And we were able to figure that out partly through the IT maze or the Infant Toddler Meaningful Auditory Integration Skill. And this skill is a series of questions that are posed to parents about if their child is benefiting from the amplification that they have. And the, through the questions, it helps the audiologist gauge how the child is doing at home with language development when using the devices versus not using them. So again, at the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned that Mary is nine months old, and this is her nine month old audiogram. You'll notice in the threshold area of the audiogram, so right over here, um, she has majority no response across all the frequencies as indicated by these arrows here and here and here and here and here and here. Um, but surprisingly, we do have some responses and those are here and here at 250 hertz and at 500 hertz. And I started these thresholds because these are likely a vibrotactile response, meaning that Mary is not really responding to the sound, but more likely responding to the shaking of the bone oscillator on her head, because we know when we get to that 45 at 250 hertz or 55 dB at 500 hertz, we are providing both physical stimulation as well as the sound stimulation. And she also has normal temps here, which just let us know that there's no middle ear pathology to worry about. 
Okay, because that hearing aid trial did not provide any benefit for Mary, we moved on to the second device selection. And at her nine month old appointment, her parents decided to move forward with bilateral, meaning both ears, cochlear implantation. Since Mary was not receiving any perceived benefit from the aids, there was nothing to lose. With cochlear implants, either Mary will stay the same or more ideally and more possibly get better or have better perception of sound. And her parents were given the options between all the cochlear implant brands, and they decided to go with bilateral advanced bionics, Sky Cochlear Implant Marvels. And just like the Marvel Phonak hearing aids that we were talking about, these Marvel cochlear implants also have great streaming compatibility, which is really important when children start school. And they are rechargeable, so there's no little batteries that the child could choke on. So even better than the hearing aids. Now, when a child gets cochlear implants, it's not like you pop them on and all of a sudden the child can hear and develop language normally. There's a lot of nurturing that has to go into that child to make sure that they're able to develop language, spoken language. And there, to illustrate that, I talked about two potential outcomes that could happen with Mary. So this is scenario A, let me back up. Mom and dad both decide to make Mary's language development the focus of their lives for the next several years. After successful cochlear implantation, they take great care to make sure that she is constantly stimulated with both ASL and English in their home. Both parents are extremely involved. From nine months to two years, Mary receives early intervention services from a speech language pathologist who specializes in working with children in hear with hearing loss as a part of an IFSP or individualized family service plan. And also that could have gone up to three years because that's when early intervention ends. Her parents also take her to several baby classes at the local park district so that she can interact socially with children her own age and be exposed to lots of language outside of her home. When Mary is old enough to go to preschool, she attends Child's Voice with an IEP or an Individualized Education Plan. There, the focus is on development of spoken language and Child's Voice is a local auditory oral school in the Chicagoland area. Mary also attends ASL classes at her local park district with her mother and her ASL continues to improve. By kindergarten, Mary is successfully communicating in both English and ASL and switches over to a 504 plan. So I love scenario A because in scenario A, the two goals that the parents had set for their child at the beginning of her language development journey, um, those goals were met because Mary is developing both ASL and English skills in this scenario. Now let's move on to scenario B. So Mary had a successful cochlear implant surgery, but little counseling followed it. Mom and dad are confused about the steps necessary to help Mary and try to fit her language development into their current schedules. Dad continues to travel for work often, which means he is not around a lot to give Mary the English language stimulation that she needs. They participate in early intervention with a speech language pathologist, but she's not an expert at working with children with hearing loss. Mom stays home with Mary and communicates with her mostly in ASL because that's her first language. Mary becomes fluent in ASL. When it's time to start preschool, Mary is placed in a classroom at her local preschool with an ASL interpreter as a part of her IEP or individualized education plan. She continues to develop ASL skills, but her English language development stagnates due to lack of stimulation and training. Now, scenario B is not ideal because the parents' goals were not met for Mary. She is fluent in ASL, which is wonderful, but she doesn't have um, the English skills that they were hoping she would have. And this just goes to show how important proper counseling and referrals are for us to do as audiologists. An audiologist easily could have 
given Mary and her family a referral to a speech language pathologist who specialized in language development for kids with cochlear implants. And they also could have helped set her up in a more ideal situation where English, English language stimulation it would have been more accessible in the home environment. And lastly, an audiologist could have helped the parents um, find out about different educational options that are out there for kids with cochlear implants who want to develop English language skills. Now, the moral of the story is that even though Mary received the same audibility, the exact same cochlear implant in scenario A and scenario B, her language development was completely dependent on her environment. So when we are counseling patients, it's important for us to make sure that the parents and the child all understand that the success of cochlear implants, it's not just like a light switch. You don't just turn on the device and it works automatically. You turn it on and slowly over time, the more you work at it, the better you get with language. All right, thank you so much for listening to my case study on pediatric amplification. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comment section below. Bye.